Hello, and good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today on this sunny Saturday afternoon. Thank you for everybody in person for joining, and a big hello to those online joining wherever you are around the world. Um, before I introduce my speakers, I just want to go through some housekeeping. Apologies if some of you heard this before. Um, we'll be taking questions towards the end of the session. For those here in person, there'll be a mic roving around. For our online audience, do submit questions on the question box. It's below your video. Online audiences can also use the tabs above the video to buy and have a browse of speaker books. The event will also have live captioning and there'll be BSL interpretation for those who need it. For those online, look at the tabs below the video. On the morning of the 24th of February, last year. All of us witnessed something that had not been seen for generations. War on European soil when Russia invaded Ukraine. I use the term witness deliberately because history is not confined, confined to textbooks. We experience history as it unfolds, whether it's on live blogs on our phones or watching our news anchors on television. My name is Shafi and I'm a journalist and I like to think of my job as similar to that of a historian's. We observe, we interpret and we report. And for many years I covered British politics and the comforts of that here in London. But two months ago I swapped life in London to live in Estonia where I'm now just a two hour drive from the Russian border and I've been observing the spillover effects of Russia on its European neighbours. And like many of its neighbours, Estonia was annexed into the Soviet Union and re-emerged as independent in 1991, weirdly the year of my birth. And you speak to anyone above 32 and they will tell you this in fluent English. And these are direct quotes I've had. Do not be so naive about Russia. Indeed, you Western Europeans are incredibly naive about Russia's past as well as its present. So here's a chance to rectify some of those concerns today. What you're about to hear is not a talk about Vladimir Putin or the KGB. Rather, it's an attempt to understand modern day Russia at its embryonic stages. Because to understand Russia as it is today, we must understand its beginnings. So our two guests each bring their own set of expertise. We have Sandsny Beaver. His books include Stalingrad, Berlin, D-Day, The Battle for Spain, and Second World War. Sir Anthony is a historian of war, and he's received major prizes in the UK and abroad. And he's sold more than eight and a half million copies so far. And we have Clive Myrie the BBC's chief news correspondent. He's had a career spanning more than 30 years across the globe from Africa, Asia, Europe, and was the former Washington correspondent. Uh, I'm sure many of you remember watching Clive at the onset of the Russian invasion in Kyiv last year. Uh, and I'm informed that Clive won a Royal Television Society Award for that recently. So, before I hand it over to both Sir Anthony and Clive, please could you give our guests a warm round of applause. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, Sir Anthony, I'm a fan. I've been for a long time. So it's a pleasure for me. Mutual collaboration. <laughs> we'll pat each other on the back. Um, congratulations on a wonderful book, full of rich detail, as to be expected from Sir Anthony, uh, vividly bringing to life um, this momentous moment in 20th century history. Most people, I think, are aware of who the Reds are and the Whites, maybe even the Blacks, the anarchists, in all of this, who eventually fell out with the Reds. Then there are the Greens the local militias opposed to the Reds and land requisitioning at the time, opposed to the whites and foreigners. 
um, who were involved in the conflict, the British, the French, the Americans, and so on. This was a global conflagration, which is something I think we should remember. You make brilliant use, of course, of diaries. Prokofiev, Gorky, Vladimir Dmitrievich Nabokov, the great writer's dad, so one of Tolstoy's daughters. Then, of course, the archive research across Russia. Uh, and, of course, you dedicate the book to Luba Vinogradova, um, the Russian historian who helped put all this together. So this might sound like a weird question to begin with, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How do you decide what you're going to put in and what you're going to leave out? Um, a very good question, and, and, and not an easy one necessarily to answer. Yeah. You're always conscious, especially when you're dealing with such horrors as one's dealing with here, um, you know, do you run the risk of writing what some people would describe almost as war pornography because of the horrors? On the other hand, I would follow Vasily Grossman's reaction when he wrote about Treblinka. Mm. He said, it's the duty of the writer to write it, and it is the civilian duty of the reader to read it. Now, whether I'm not suggesting that people are obliged to read it by any means, but um, I think that you really do have to present it. And there's a particularly important reason why one needs to bring out these horrors, because, and it was also, in many ways, the reason why I wrote the book in the first place, not because of the horrors, but because... All historians, I think, now have more or less recognised that the First World War was the original catastrophe of the 20th century. But it was the Russian Civil War with this, its very horrors, its destruction, its cruelties, um, sadism in many cases, created such a vicious circle of fear between left and right that we saw really the way that it dominated or at least uh, led to uh, the 20th century with the Spanish Civil War and then the Second World War. And really, the split between left and right, the fear uh, on the right of the middle classes that they were going to be annihilated as uh, Lenin had promised, or um, the fear on the left was that the white counter-reaction would crush liberalism and socialism uh, in every form. Um, this sort of Manichaean split, which was created um, really did affect Europe and beyond. Um, and that is why I think one really does have to emphasize um, those horrors. Um, I mean, obviously, there are one, one or two which are so ghastly that you feel you've done enough anyway in terms of mm. signaling uh, what it is. But it also links in with something which I'm sure we'll talk about, which is um, trying to understand why it should have been so much more horrific, for example, in the Russian Civil War yeah. than in the Spanish Civil War, yeah. where, yes, they would put people up against a wall from the other side and shoot them, um, but that was partly out of fear, but also to prevent them coming back to shoot them. Mm. Uh, in Russia, there was an element, really, of, as I say, sadism. Um, and one needs, in a way, to understand where all this comes from, because obviously it is not just a question of the Russian Civil War, but we saw it in 1945 or in um, the Revenge of the Red Army uh, as it advanced into Germany. Um, and of course, we are seeing it in Ukraine as well. Yeah, we'll get into the horrors a little yep. bit later on. But how difficult is it telling this particular story without getting bogged down in political ideology? Trotskyism, Leninism, Stalinism, and, and, and so on. How important is it to try to keep the aims of the protagonists simple and straightforward? Uh, again, um, I think it is important to try to, to clarify things a little. I mean, virtually every book on the subject of the Russian Revolution has usually come from political historians... Yeah emphasizing the ideological splits, whether within the, whether within the cent Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party or whatever it might be, because that's their expertise. Well, I came over from a different direction, actually, Orlando Fajic, who's a, a very old friend, um, said, you know, it is about time that somebody actually wrote it from a, a military point of view, because right. we haven't really seen that at all. Uh, so that, was, that, that, that encouraged me, as you might imagine, very much in the, in the early, early days. Um, I think the, the thing to do is, I think one can, I hope I haven't oversimplified it, but I think one's got to be able to explain how Lenin, out of his simple brilliance, I mean, Le Lenin's brilliance uh, was his ability to spot the weaknesses in others and in the situations. 
and he showed incredible foresight when it was the question of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk with the Germans uh, in March 1918, which um, for the Germans, it was the biggest success of the whole of the First World War. Uh, suddenly, they were occupying almost a third of, um, of European Russia, if not more, uh, and the whole of Ukraine. Um, but Lenin realized it was worth the humiliation when everybody else in the Bolshevik party refused to do it. So one's got to understand what Lenin's real identity and real um, objectives were uh, and how he achieved it. And he certainly, he certainly managed it. But he, when you've got somebody who knows exactly what they want to do yeah. and everybody else is sort of rather confused and uh, worrying about sort of democratic niceties or whatever, uh, I'm afraid the person who knows where they want to go um, has a distinct advantage. Indeed. I mean, was there a sense that in writing this book you were perhaps demystifying the communist mythology surrounding the revolution to, to an extent. The storming of the Winter Palace is, is, is a good example, I think. I think most of that had been done already. It really actually started um, in sort of 91, 92. I mean, General Volkogonov's biography of Lenin was the very first, which actually showed that Lenin was just as ghastly as Stalin. Um, and all of the horrors that we always associate with Stalin, whether the secret police, the gulag or whatever, actually it all started under Lenin. Um, so Lenin has had a very easy ride, um, usually, uh, of course, supported by uh, Soviet mythology during all of the, those Cold War years. Um, but it didn't take very long for people to realise that actually that, was, uh, um, that, that really was mythology rather than reality. Mm. I mean, you capture very profoundly, I think, the chaos and oddities and, and black humour sometimes of war. Um, your description of the panic before the Red Army arrived in Odessa, for instance, the panic of trying to, to get out of the city on the last evacuation ship, yes. which reminds me of Sudan. Now, those left behind hiding their spectacles so that they don't look like they're intellectuals, um, dressing like peasants, you know, yes. hiding books, growing beards. There is an absurdity to war, isn't there, to, to, to conflict that that is is part of the experience of conflict. Yes, and experience is really what one needs to do. I mean, I think we always think that the duty of the historian is to understand and to try to sort of pass on that understanding. And for that, you've really got to give a flavour of what it's like at the time. I mean, you're absolutely right to signal the whole thing about spectacles. Um, you know, that uh, as far as... Uh, the peasants, the workers, um, who'd had absolutely nothing and been so badly treated, um, they needed some sort of symbol, in a way, for identifying what they thought were their class enemies. Uh, and for many of them, of course, you didn't wear a tie. Um, that would have been too much of a giveaway, or a hat. Um, but spectacles, too, uh, would basically uh, put you in the category of... Uh, what uh, Lenin described as basically the uh, uh, sort of uh, liberal bourgeoisie of the intelligentsia, um, which meant you were also on the, on the killing list. Scary stuff. Yes, but I mean, one's got to understand the sort of, the, the, the really deep, deep divide yeah. uh, and the effects that it might have, because we, from our position today, cannot imagine it otherwise. How difficult is it to get under the skin of the peasantry? Uh, very, very hard. I mean, you know, you can, uh, I mean, there, are some, there have been some wonderful books. I mean, obviously, you can imagine, but not just uh, uh, history books, but obviously some of the great, uh, some of the great novels of the past, mm. uh, to understand how, for many of the peasantry, uh, the idea of the Tsar and autocracy and the Orthodox Church um, were sort of, you know, permanent fixtures which uh, they could never imagine doing without. Uh, until the opportunity started to come, which was really in sort of 1917 and the, the disintegration of the Russian, of the Tsar, Tsarist army. Mm. Uh, Russian history had shown how there was an incredible forbearance amongst the peasantry of the suffering that they absorbed, the suffering that they went through. Um, and, um, and then they would explode. Uh, in anger, when one had the sort of Pugachev rebellion or whatever it might be. And this is very much what Alexander Pushkin described as, you know, uh, Russian revolt, uh, senseless and merciless. Mm. But it is getting that perspective from writers, yes. um, from others, because, yep. of course, you know, the peasants necessarily, perhaps, you know, illiterate and wouldn't have written stuff down. They, they wouldn't have left an old, their own personal record. 
of what's going on. But then in the 19th century, I mean, you had the sort of, um, many of the young um, students sort of went to the country, they went to the peasantry. Right. Um, and they would turn up uh, with tremendous um, idealism and uh, in, in, in the villages. Um, and the peasants, in many cases, would actually chase them out or uh, uh, basically uh, d denounce them to the police because they knew that they were going to be trouble mm. uh, if, they started, if they started listening to them. But also because um, to be suddenly told, well, actually, uh, we should all go do away with the existing structure um, was something which was too much for them um, to imagine. And they found that distinct, dis dis distinctly alarming. Mm. But, you know, they had so many reasons for uh, resentment. But unfortunately, this turned into sort of massive destruction in all directions, whether it was the burning of manor houses and even the sort of um, destruction of, uh, um, of, of livestock <coughs> when, when it wasn't necessarily stolen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Breslitovsk, you've, you've mentioned that a little bit. Um, mm. The treaty, 1918, Russia withdraws from World War I. Um, and interesting, so, talking about trying to find comedy in, in all of this. Yeah, I'm afraid that's tough. <laughs> yeah, I'm at the conference with the, uh, with the Germans oh, yes. to, to discuss <laughs> terms. Exactly. You know where I'm going with this one. Yes, um, the Russian delegation included intellectuals, soldiers, but they forgot to include any peasants. Um, so they waylay a random chap <laughs> off a farm. I don't know how. They get him en route and they persuade him to come along to the conference. And uh, he's at the grand dinner at the end of the day. And he's asked whether he wants red wine or white wine. And he says, whichever is strongest. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, Brest-Litovsk, mm -hmm. that treaty, is that the beginning of everything that we're seeing today in Ukraine? Is it the beginning of the Russians trying to desperately to get back those territories that they lost as a result of that treaty in the Second World War? Is that the original sin to a degree of what we're seeing now in Ukraine? Um, I don't think it had, it had a big effect at the time. What one has to remember was that unlike the Finns, uh, who were able to seize the opportunity, um, and the opportunity came where, when we've heard, I mean, it's ridiculous, but Putin blames Lenin uh, for having offered the possibility of self-determination. Uh, uh, to the different um, populations or nationalities of the Russian Empire. And uh, what he didn't realize was that actually the Finnish whites uh, were going to be far better organized and actually have the military experience because they'd sent a lot of their guys to Germany and they'd been serving in Jaeger uh, regiments. And so they were able to form themselves into a very effective um, force. And that's where the Soviet Union lost Finland. Um, Ukraine, I mean, Petliura uh, and the Ukrainian nationalists were very small in terms of numbers on the ground, and they had really no forces at all, very, very few. Um, and the few troops they had when they marched through Kiev uh, were all dressed in um, costumes from the opera, um, from the opera of the Zaporozhny Cossacks, uh, which sort of reproduced, of course, uh, rather contemptuous laughter amongst the uh, great Russians, as of course they called themselves, yeah. um, who looked down on the little Russians. Um, <coughs> Ukraine didn't really have a chance uh, for a very long time, but its um, culture um, still sort of kept going, thank goodness, under, in a way, almost underground. Um, but I think that it was, let's face it, it was the, uh, uh, the, or the uh, uh, famines of the 30s, yeah. um, started by Stalin, um, which really, I think, created this sort of angry political nationalism uh, rather than just the cultural nationalism, which on the whole had sort of existed up until then. Mm. And Ukraine did have a distinct culture. Oh, yes, it did. It certainly did. I mean, you know, it had, it had, it had it, some of its great poets, it had painters and so forth. Um, but, of course, they were sort of seen just as sort of, you know, local, regional, uh, regional characters uh, from a, a, a perspective t um, from Moscow. Mm. And as a result then... What Putin is saying today is incorrect. It's not its own in distinct culture. It's not got its own distinct heritage. That's all nonsense. 
Oh, well, it is. I mean, what I find ironic in a way is that um, uh, Putin um, goes, goes on about sort of that uh, Kiev was the origin of Russian culture. Um, well, I mean, in, from that point of view, then uh, Russia should be part of Ukraine. I mean, you know, the, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a ludicrous, it's a ludicrous argument. Yeah. Uh, and we've had one ludicrous argument from him after another. I mean, as for his lecture the year before the... Uh, uh, the year before the invasion, a lot of that written, written by Medinsky, the, f the former culture minister, uh, mm. who's an idiot of the first water. Um, um, I mean, a very quick example. Um, Putin is desperate to get Kazakhstan back. So he spent a fortune making this film called Panfilov and His 28 Men. And this is a, uh, a, an extravaganza war movie uh, showing how just 28 soldiers under the command of a Russian, uh, they were all Kazakhs, of course, um, managed to hold up a German panzer division. Well, the head of the National Archives of GAF uh, said, well, we know this is total rubbish because in our archives, um, we've got this um, report from a journalist with Krasnaya Zvezda, the uh, Red Army newspaper, uh, saying how this whole story was invented for propaganda reasons. Medinsky immediately said, anybody who doubts this story, even if it's untrue, is below slime. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that gives you an idea, if, if you like, the intellectual quality uh, of some of the people surrounding. Yes. Uh, but the, the, I think the interesting thing we must always forget, uh, which is another paradox, of course, is that Putin is an inheritor of the white Russian tradition, yeah. not the Reds. Um, there were the white Russian exiles, and they were the ones who came up with this whole idea of holy Slav, Orthodox Russia, uh, which had the right to dominate the whole of the Eurasian landmass, as Dugan um, said, you know, from Vladivostok to Dublin, um, because of their spiritual superiority. Um, but as I say, this came from the whites, and you've only got to look at the Kremlin, which has not a single symbol of the Soviet Union really left in it, uh, just statues of czars, and of course uh, Putin's palace on the Black Sea, which is entirely uh, gold uh, double-headed eagles. Mm. And that sort of ties into the suggestion that it's the Russian Empire he's trying to Absolutely. reconstitute, Absolutely. not yep. the Soviet Union. Mm. Um, I mentioned a little bit about the Americans and the Canadians and the French and the Serbs. I mean, this is a global conflict, isn't it? Just, just talk a little bit about that. Well, it wasn't... I mean, most of them didn't really do any fighting. Um, the, I mean, the British, the only people who really did any fighting on, say, for example, the British, which was quite a large uh, contribution, purely in material terms, i.e. Yeah. Uh, Churchill to help the whites uh, were giving them their, uh, the spare ammunition and uniforms and guns or whatever left over from the First World War. Mm -hmm. Because one has to remember that up until uh, the end of uh, more or less of uh, 1918, um, we couldn't get into the Black Sea because of the Turks. Mm -hmm. And so it was only really with the Turkish surrender that that was possible. But the Japanese landed 84,000 troops altogether in Vladivostok. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they wanted to take over part of the maritime region in the Far East. Nowadays, what are we seeing? We're seeing we know that Xi wants to get Vladivostok back, um, you know, as, which quite rightly one can understand, you know, going back to the unequal treaties of the, of the 19th, 19th century. Mm. Um, so, I mean, if you like, Putin, Putin is um, having, sitting down to tea with a tiger uh, when he's dealing with uh, Xi, but he's got no option. Mm. I mean, it's interesting because you talk about there's, there's a, a, a section of the book called The Fatal Compromise. Mm -hmm. um, and that is where all these outsiders are trying to sort of, you know, uh, influence events. Yes. Um, do you see any parallels between that outside influence mm -hmm. and now? In the sense that some weapons are being sent, moral support is being sent, but there aren't troops on the ground. And as a result, you end up with this, well, we might win, we might not win, we're not sure situation well you're once never sure and especially not in a civil war mm. um but i think on the whole one can say that actually um nato and jens stoltenberg the uh, secretary general have actually handled things pretty well considering the complications of the circumstances mm. um you know that they have not gone too far too fast uh when it's a question of uh, provoking or the uh, to avoid the danger of provoking uh the the russians too far um but at the same time um at least enabling uh ukraine to defend itself where we go next will rather depend on obviously the ukrainian uh, counteroffensive coming in the uh in the spring 
Um, but I, I think that actually the coordination now is far, far better uh, um, than in, say, 1919, mm. uh, which was really was the sort of the crucial year of the, of the Russian Civil War. I mean, the, the communications were ridiculous. I mean, you have Admiral Kolchak in Siberia, you have General Denikin down in the south in the Caucasus, uh, and Yudinich in the Baltic, um, and quite often it took three weeks for any message to pass mm. between them. And this is why Churchill was getting it wrong so often, was because simply he didn't have the information at the time. Mm. And of course, uh, should we say a certain amount of uh, um, a certain amount of uh, over optimism on Churchill's part, um, as Lloyd George put it. He said uh, Churchill, as the grandson of the Duke, um, was bound uh, a grandson of the Duke, was of course uh, rather bound to be opposed to those who were killing grand dukes in every direction. You know? <laughs> mm. But I just but I just wonder if. That I mean, you you believe then that the, the the pace of Western support for Ukraine at the moment, um, you know, taking eight nine months before they decide they're going to send them leopard tanks, for instance, you know, that um, wariness yes. makes sense, or is it simply creating and continuing the war in a way that means that the Russians are simply not being dealt with as quickly as possible? Well, you're quite right, one can argue it both ways. Yeah. Um, and there's certainly an element of, uh, one should say, even moral cowardice, um, you know, for, for Germany having got it so badly wrong in the past yeah. in terms of the threat coming from the East and the belief. I mean, it's amazing how we keep repeating the same mistakes. Before the First World War, the great bestseller was Norman Angell's book, which argued that uh, uh, war in Europe was absolutely impossible. This was coming out in 1910 mm. uh, and republished in the beginning of 1914. Um, war in Europe was unthinkable because we were so integrated through commerce and communications. Well, we hear Angela Merkel doing exact, making exactly the same mistake. We don't get dictators. We don't get dictator syndrome. Um, the British and the French in the 30s could not believe that anybody would be stupid enough uh, to want another war in Europe after the First World War, and they totally underestimated Hitler, and that again is why um, we underestimated Putin's determination to take back Ukraine by force. Mm. Um, you mentioned at the beginning um, atrocities and the way that the war was prosecuted, um, the revolution and then the civil war. Uh, the violence in your book is 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 graphic, and it's from all sides. Yes, that that, that needs to be acknowledged. The routine hacking of um, men, women, and children to death, mutilations, eye gouging, castration, nailing epaulets to men's shoulders, raping nurses, um, people roasted over fires, put in blast furnaces, strung up by their limbs, mass starvation. Um, I was in uh, Bucha. Um, this would be exactly a year ago. And uh, we saw the mass graves. And one wonders if what I saw is simply the continuation of a Russian way of prosecuting wars or is just war prosecuted by anybody horrible anyway. Well, war is never, uh, certainly never pleasant. It's only a question of degrees of horror. Yeah. Um, but one does need to get look back into Russian history to try to understand why uh, Russian uh, forces uh, do not follow the same sort of uh, uh, code of conduct uh, as, say, Western European or American forces. Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, they, we've known of American and uh, even the odd British atrocity and so forth. Uh, so it isn't a question of trying to pretend that it never happens. Yeah. Uh, but on the whole, it's a question of whether it's the uh, general run of things or whether it's exceptional. In the case of Russia, um, I think that a number of historians, not all agree, but would go back to the 13th century and the Mongol invasions, which A, gave... Um, the Russians, the impression that the world was again them, that um, they were surrounded, and this mentality uh, of sort of Rus contramundum. Um, but it was also the fact that the uh, Mongol way of war was a war of terror, which meant uh, mass murder of civilians, mass rape, mass uh, destruction of towns and cities. Mm. Um, as if that was the only and the most uh, cost-effective method of warfare. 
So um, where, where, where do the changes come? Well, I mean, let's face it, uh, it was pretty horrific through most of the Middle Ages where uh, if a city was put to the store, was sword after, um, after being captured, or um, even worse, in the uh, 17th century, the wars of religion in Europe uh, were just as horrific as anything which the Russians had perpetrated. But there was one particular difference, I think, and that was that in Europe we did have the Enlightenment, uh, which started to change ideas. And, of course, there were many more humanitarian developments in the 19th century, like the invention of the Red Cross and a whole lot of um, other, other aspects. I mean, uh, what we do have tended to underestimate is also how badly the Russians treat their own people. Yeah. Uh, we've seen this in Ukraine. I remember in the early 90s, um, when I was in Russia, of the way that... Um, of the conscripts for the Russian army, um, there were up to 5,000 suicides a year because of the way they'd been bullied and treated and all the rest of it. And Russian generals just thought this was funny. I mean, they simply uh, laughed mm. at um, any idea of that. Mm. And what do we see in Ukraine? We see mobile uh, um, crematoria, uh, so to be able to conceal the number of soldiers' uh, uh, mass graves without their bodies being returned to families. Um, and, I mean, you know, when you get to Prigozhin and Wagner and the idea of sort of, you know, uh, you, you, beat your, um, you beat any deserter to death with uh, sledgehammers, mm. well, I mean, that comes actually out, straight out of the SS playbook, um, where the SS had this idea that Kameraden uh, Erziehung, which meant a lesson in comradeship, uh, meant that um, anybody who uh, deserted um, had to be beaten to death by their own comrades. Mm. Um, and, and it is that sort of mentality it will also explain perhaps why, for example, a British or a French or an American army would never have survived at Stalingrad. Um, but... It, well, it worked. I mean, that's the bottom line. It, it worked. It Being worked. that brutal. It, it, it was that brutal. But, I mean, in many cases, it was also genuine self-sacrifice, uh, yeah. as well okay. as uh, total terror mm. of uh, um, the consequences if you did uh, run away. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you know, when you have an army which is prepared to shoot down, for example, Russian children, the snipers were ordered to shoot down Russian children at Stalingrad uh, because they were being bribed. I mean, they were starving. They'd been trapped behind German lines. Um, they were being bribed with a crust of bread by a soldier to simply to fill their water bottle in the Volga. Um, so... Well, well c civilians were, were targeted by snipers in, in Sarajevo. Yes, um, that happened there too. I also wonder if the, the, the extreme level of violence is sort of tied in with everything you've said, but also tied in with the fact that this was an ideological war, the revolution and the civil war. Yep. It was about ideas. <laughs> so you were not just defeating another human being, you were defe defeating an ideology. And to a degree, that makes it even more important to crush it and to crush it violently. Um, Lenin realised right from the start, don't mess with ideas as far as talking to the general population. Um, he just used sound bites. And um, in fact, in the book, I mean, to describe the way that uh, young uh, um, uh, carders, uh, young Bolshevik carders, uh, are being taught sound bites, sound bites, sound bites. Mm. Um, don't get involved in any discussion. Um, and it was far more effective in that particular way. And it was the way that um, Lenin dehumanised his opponents. Right. You know, they were, they were lice, they were vermin, they were rats, they deserved to be crushed, mm. um, which was so effective. Um, the whites actually had no ideology, really, apart from getting back, restoring the old ways. Um, and that's why Red Terror and White Terror were rather different. I mean, White Terror, actually, was just bitter resentment at having had their estates burned down or their um, st things stolen from their houses or whatever it might be. Um, and, um, but, you know, Red Terror was in many cases, like also in the Spanish Civil War, uh, when you are in an area where you know you're not actually in a firm majority, um, and then people will adopt methods of, uh, of terror simply to uh, cow the population. Mm. I mean, when you come across some of these characters, um, vividly... Are we, are we on to the psychopaths? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the, 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 the Czech example. madman, yeah. Sienko. Yes. Um, uh, Shlashchov. Um, yes. You know, he, and I love this description, Anthony. 
He had the air of an overgrown and corrupt cherub. <laughs> an eccentric general, cocaine addict, um, who took his pet crow in a cage into battle. Yes. When you come across these characters, do you just think, this is going to be a great book? Where this did is they, going to be amazing. No, but you well, ask, where do they come from? And where, <laughs> where are do they, they come today? From? Exactly. I mean, I, when you come across them, what do you think? What goes through your mind? Well, you know that war, and especially civil war, will always bring the most violent and often, quite often, the maddest to the surface because they're the ones who stand out. I mean, not just Slashov, but I mean Skuro, um, who with his, with his wolf sotnia of uh, yes. Cossack, Cossack. The psycho Cossack. The psycho Cossacks. <laughs> I mean, you know, the Cossacks were terrifying. I mean, literally terrifying, there's no doubt about it. Probably still are today, but anyway. Um, and um, he actually was handed over by the British, handed back to Stalin, uh, along with a lot of the Cossacks at the end of 1945, and of course was uh, executed then. And most of them didn't survive. Um, Ungarn Sternberg, I had a whole other chapter on Ungarn Sternberg, who was uh, the worst of the lot. I mean, totally mad. He was basically a Buddhist, but at the same time, um, he was such a ferocious anti-Semite, he made, he made Himmler look, look an absolute choir boy in comparison. Um, I mean, it, some, as you say, I mean, some of these characters are simply astonishing. Ungarn Sternberg was, I mean, some of them were brilliant cavalry commanders. Mm. Um, but I mean, they should have been locked up at the moment, the, well, in fact, they should have been locked up before the war started, but in fact, they should certainly have been locked up as soon as the war ended. But in most cases, they were arrested and then executed. Yeah. I mean, is there anyone that comes out of the book where you think, you know, this is, this is, this is a person who's honourable, who's decent, who who was trying to do something. Well, yes, amazing. General Kappel, who was one of the few white generals who really was, I think, uh, an admirable man. He was not uh, one of the hardline czarist officers. I mean, he was, he was basically a right socialist revolutionary, which meant basically he was sort of uh, uh, a moderate socialist, um, who was literally loved by his soldiers and admired by everybody else. Uh, and Putin had his body returned to uh, Russia and um, buried, reburied, as well as Denikin, who was the great commander in the south. So again, this was the thing of um, Putin's admiration for, really for uh, the white cause. Mm. It, talking about the white cause, was it, was it doomed to failure? Yes. Because it's such... Oh, there you go. Let's move on. Um, it was in such a disparate group of, you know, anti-red, anti-this, anti-that, but not really working together. No, you're quite right. I mean, the uh, question of the, the, the white... Uh, alliance, as one can only describe it. There were sort of three basic elements to it. Uh, one were the, as uh, was what was called Komuch, which was basically the uh, those uh, socialist revolutionaries who still believed in the Constituent Assembly. assembly. Never forget, <coughs> forgive the Bolsheviks uh, for having destroyed uh, their one chance of democracy in Russia. Um, but they, of course, were in a minority, and when it came to military affairs, they were bound to be outvoted, outcommanded, if you like, by all of the white generals um, who had joined up with, uh, with Denikin or with, with Kolchak. Um, so you have the czarist officers and generals. <coughs> the most militant, actually, were the young lieutenants or whatever, who'd seen their livelihoods destroyed, taken away, mm. their inheritance from their families and all the rest of it. And they were the sort of really angry, uh, bitter ones. The old generals tended to be t thoroughly corrupt. Uh, they were just trying to make enough money during the war so as to pay for their exile, because I think most of them knew that they weren't going to win. Um, and then the third element, of course, is the Cossacks. Well, the Cossacks were actually the most ferocious uh, and in many ways the most effective of the lot, but they weren't interested really in fighting outside Cossack territory. Uh, so whether in Siberia or whether in uh, uh, the Caucasus and uh, the Don Basin, um, you know, they weren't very reliable from that point of view. So you have this uh, basically uh, alliance which is in many ways incompatible. Uh, the irony is, but there's a lesson to it, of course, if you look at the Spanish Civil War, uh, you have total unity on the white nationalist side under Franco, mm. uh, which of course is far more effective in military affairs, um, but uh, you don't get that on the, uh, on the red side because they were all quarrelling amongst, amongst each other. Uh, in the Russian Civil War, it was exactly the opposite way around. Yeah, that's a really interesting comparison. I mean, do you see any... Are there any connections between Tsar Nicholas and Putin? Um, in 
the sense that they are surrounded by their own echo chamber, that they're being given information that they want to hear, that they're not necessarily fully aware of what is going on outside. Well, Tsar Nicholas II, frankly, was, um, I mean, he was somebody with so many complexes. I mean, it, when even before becoming Tsar, um, he was short, and all of the other Grand Dukes in the Romanovs were all incredibly tall. Um, and he, he actually said in a pathetic way to one of his cu cousins, who's going to take orders from a dwarf? Um, he had no confidence at all. Right. And the terrifying thing was, of course, that his uh, wife, the Empress uh, Alexandra, uh, of course, was um, you know, a far stronger character and dominated him um, completely. Mm. Um, but that's, shall we say, that's really uh, another story. Around Putin, and this is actually, in a way, I think I'd compare it slightly with the Soviet Union, and right. it's actually one of the frightening things, is that even in the Soviet Union, um, you may have had a big boss... Uh, whether Stalin or whoever or Brezhnev later on or whatever, but there was always a line of succession if things were going to go wrong. Mm. Uh, there is no line of succession here. I mean, yes, we may see a palace, re um, palace coup or revolt. Uh, do we see Patrushev or even more, God save us, from uh, Prigozhin? Um, but the thing is that Putin has created so many different organisations um, on the basis of divide and rule. So you don't have just have the GRU military intelligence or the FSB or the SVR, which is foreign intelligence. Um, you also have uh, uh, the Wagner Group, uh, which is uh, increasingly uh, unpredictable, and uh, its leader, Immortal. Uh, you have the army, um, and you also have the National Guard, which responds directly to Putin himself. So he's, his only interest is actually staying in power, which does make negotiation of any form uh, almost impossible. And I mean, I was discussing actually with a um, sort of a British diplomat from uh, a couple of days ago um, about the, one of the real dangers is that in Cold War I, we could have usually trust what Chinese and Russian communist leaders had said. When they had made, given their word on something, mm. they, were, they usually stuck to it. We're now in Cold War II, and you cannot count on that anymore. They are prepared to break their word at any moment. And this is actually making conventional diplomacy almost impossible. And as a geopolitical change, that is deeply scary. And it makes concluding the war necessarily, potentially, around a negotiating table very hard. Yes. I mean, I thought that uh, Zelensky was going to threaten Crimea so as to use that as a bargaining chip. Mm. I was ticked off by um, another British ambassador who'd been ambassador in Ukraine before, who was extremely impressive, and she said to me, listen, um, you're wrong, in fact. Zelensky is so angry about the atrocities, so angry mm. about the whole of the setup, and I'm sure this probably corresponds with what you discovered in your time in Ukraine, um, that um, he's not going to stop until he's got every single soldier out of Crimea. Now, he can do it by cutting off Crimea, both Perikop and um, the Kerch uh, Bridge, and then the water and all the rest of it. Um, but, you know, will that still be a basis? Because uh, Putin, and actually, I'm mean, also most Russians, not just Putin, um, see Crimea as sort of existential Russia. Mm. Uh, and I'm not sure that they would ever accept it. Mm. <laughs> so at the same time, Zelensky has also got his own constituency of his people. And they have been through all manner of privations. Yes. And to hand over Crimea would be rewarding aggression, wouldn't it? Well, that would be going back to nineteen four. Uh, sorry, to twenty fourteen. Um, you're 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 right. I mean, say rewarding is is difficult. The Russians wouldn't see it in that way. I well, mean, no. <laughs> we, we have to see. We have to see. There are two totally incompatible perspectives. Yeah. Uh, you know, on the status of Crimea, and as far as the Russians are concerned, you know, Catherine the Great, Potemkin, uh, Sevastopol, or whatever. Um, that you know, Crimea was always uh, Russian, and just because uh, Khrushchev decided on a whim to hand it over to Ukraine, um, they didn't regard us. Uh, as relevant. Um, and there is an element of truth in that. I mean, not that um, I, I believe that actually the only way to end the war, in fact, is for Zelensky to take Crimea, because for Putin that would be uh, the, the worst disaster imaginable, because his, his popularity rating went right up over yeah. to the, well into the 90s, yes, as indeed. you will remember, yeah. uh, when they did occupy Ukraine and got away with it. Uh, to lose it would be... Uh, but also, at the same time, again, that is very much of a, a risk in terms of escalation. Yeah. All right. I think... I think we should... Uh, we, should, we, should uh, we should get a few... A few questions. Questions. And we've got quite a few. Actually, I'm going to start here. 
Right. Um, because I know f- uh, lots of people have been in touch, uh, who've been listening in and watching online. Okay, this is from uh, Penelope Blake. Yep. And she says, could a revolution ever happen in the UK? Interesting point. I would have said, and I think sort of, you know, to a certain degree, Tocqueville was sort of made, a, uh, made, made the observation, uh, which I think is absolutely right. He said the, uh, the most dangerous moment for any regime uh, which has been autocratic is when it starts to liberalise. And that's absolutely true. There's no doubt about it. But as we saw in the February Revolution in 1917 in Russia, um, a revolution will only really work when the ruling regime has completely lost confidence in itself. So for there to be a, for, for, um, a revolution in this country, or in any country, frankly, uh, it would have to depend upon the complete collapse in confidence of the, uh, uh, of the, existing, of the existing regime and system. So uh, I think, it, I, I, as things stand at the moment, as we can see from um, the polls, even though you know republicanism obviously is, uh, has has crept up since the uh, Queen Elizabeth's death, um, but I think that was all predicted in a, well in advance, and everybody imagined that, that would be the case. Um, I don't think we're gonna. I don't think we're gonna. I, I would be very surprised to see it here. Sure. All right. So sorry. Penelope. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't happening, girl. <laughs> it ain't happening. Right, OK, we're going to take some questions from the floor now. Uh, there is a gentleman... Up, 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 we'll go with a chap with the stripy shirt on there. Um, if we get a microphone to him, thank you. And then the lady in pink will go to you next. And, and in the front? And in the front, lady in yellow. Yes, lady. front there. OK, so... Thank you very much. Um, do you think there was a meaningful chance that the provisional government could have lasted? and it created a natural democracy in Russia? Or was it doomed from the start? I think it was doomed from the start. One remembers the great Alexander Herzen's uh, remark about uh, the pregnant widow uh, and the idea that there is this m- moment of, well, not moment, actually, period, of total uh, danger for any form of reform in between the collapse of the old regime and the creation of a new regime. And this was the trouble in Russia. Um, you have... The obviously the sort of the intellectuals, most of the uh, politicians, even the conservatives, uh, were all desperate to have a constituent assembly. Their um, what would eventually become their sort of Duma uh, or a new version of the Duma um, through universal suffrage. Uh, but the problem is that with the destruction of the police and of the whole of the uh, governmental mechanism of the Tsarist state. Um, you have ministers in the provisional government uh, who are called ministers, they're sitting in ministries or whatever, but they have no control whatsoever over events. I mean, they have levers which, frankly, aren't aren't (coughs) attached to anything. And this was one of the problems, so they lost control. In the countryside, the person said, well, are we taking over the land or aren't we? You know, and then they were told by even the leaders, the uh, left socialist revolutionaries, right socialist revolutionaries, who were the main political parties for the peasantry, uh, they were saying, listen, you've got to wait until the Constituent Assembly is, is ready, and then we've got to make a des- decision based on that. Well, not surprisingly, they became very impatient, and they didn't see why they should hang around. And that was why I also it was very easy for Lenin and the Bolsheviks to sabotage the creation of the Constituent Assembly. And then in January 1918, they were able to uh, basically uh, allow the deputies in, and then they had them all chased out by uh, Konstrat sailors uh, soon after midnight. So it existed for a matter of hours only. Thank you very much. Okay, Okay. Um, the lady in pink just just there? Uh, No, just, just here, there you go. Lovely, thank you. Hello. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Um, Sort of an offshoot of Penelope's question. Um, You mentioned in the context of the revolution the the institutions that people thought they could absolutely not do without that suddenly, well, changed. What are the modern institutions that are at risk and what can they do to salvage themselves? Governmental, perhaps, perhaps monarchy, perhaps even press. What, so here in, in this the country, UK, you mean? I would say UK, but if there's right. anything outstanding globally as well. Okay. okay. Well, what they can, what can they do to? Uh, well, I mean, I think your essential point is absolutely right about the whole question of institutions. Mm. Um, I was very struck by the fact that 
uh, David Frum, one of the sort of uh, political commentators in America, when the Queen died, he pointed it out very uh, clearly, I think, what a paradox it was that the Americans had created a, a constitution using the best brains that have ever been assembled in a single room uh, back in 1776. Um, and yet they had failed to prevent basically what was going to be an elective dictatorship. Um, well, he said that in the, here in Britain, you know, you have a chaotic, totally unpredictable system where, which depends on hereditary, uh, and yet there is no real um, threat or has been no real threat of a military coup or an overthrow uh, of, of the system. I think the point here is very much that if you have a republic, and I think this is something which would be interesting to discuss, say, with Australians, who, of course, want to have their own head of state, but they just don't know what to choose. Um, the vital question thing is, don't have a politician as head of state, because that is what's so dangerous. Uh, and this is, in a way, the unintended brilliance or uh, defensive nature of the British uh, regime. If you give uh, the symbols uh, of pomp and panoply of all that sort of stuff and, in a way, also command of the armed forces to the head of the state but allow them no political power whatsoever, it is much more democratic in the sense it's much less likely to create or to provide that sort of pre-revolutionary situation uh, which you might get otherwise. Um, as soon as you start having a politician up there who can move from being, say, prime minister to president, uh, if you take, say, America and Trump, uh, I mean, that's, let's, let's face it, is still a very scary possibility. Or even in France, I mean, the Fifth, um, uh, the Fifth Republic's constitution um, gives far too much power uh, to the president. But that is a problem when you have the president as the commander in chief and also as the, uh, as the political leader. Mm. Um, and this is why institutions are so important, because unless you can defend things like the Supreme Court, as we're seeing battles in Poland, we're seeing uh, a certain, um, shall we say, pressure even in this country uh, of resentment of the present government against what they think is the excessive power of judges, um, and certainly we're seeing it in the United States, um, institutions are vital if you are going to defend democracy. Uh, without them, then I think you're extremely vulnerable. And I think when it comes to my own profession, the press, um, we are in a very, very difficult situation now given social media and how that can undermine um, uh, us as an institution um, because of all kinds of nefarious and um, frankly incredible actors who can bash out stuff on a keyboard. Yes. Um, I'm going to go to a question here, and we'll go to the lady uh, in yellow there, and then I want someone on the left, on the left, on the red side. <laughs> That's the white side, the red side. The I'm Greens... Oh, uh, no, 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 Clive, we don't want to start having a civil war in the British Library. <laughs> Let's have a civil war. I'm going to go with... Um, ooh, I'm going to go with Bandit Queen. Bandit, Bandit Queen, this Bandit one. Queen. How can we ever hope to teach Russia about the terrible long-term effects of conflict and warfare, especially the psychological effects on survivors of war, on both civilians and soldiers alike? Well, um, a, a very good point. I mean, yeah. already we're getting reports from Russia, as you know any too well, um, of the psychological damage. I mean, many of them were actually deliberately recruited, particularly of uh, Prigozhin's uh, Wagner lot, um, because they were psychologically exactly. damaged in the first exactly. place. Yeah. Um, and they were returning home. And I mean, there are uh, many towns where people are literally terrorised and afraid to go out on the streets because yeah. they know that these guys have got nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. Because even if they were arrested... Um, they'd immediately be released um, by, you know, their, their former bosses. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, the psychological consequences of this war, and, of course, for Ukrainians as well. I mean, when one sees uh, the results of um, many of the atrocities, whether Bukhja and a whole lot of others, um, you know, no society can survive mm -hmm. untouched by, by that sort of horror. Yeah. yeah. OK, so... Yes. Hi. Hi, um, you, you mentioned about the fact that, you know, there were so many repercussions of this kind of origin story of conflict between the left and the right in the, in the revolution and going on to the Spanish Civil War and onwards. Yep. Do you feel like there's anything that 
we can actually learn or benefit from now when we have such an incredibly heightened state of conflict between kind of different positions across, you know, in the UK and the US, but really across the world? Uh, well, when it comes to something as extreme, obviously a civil war, uh, that is well beyond, uh, well beyond what we're seeing. Uh, the question, will we see um, will we see that sort of uh, conflict developing, particularly in the United States? I mean, there have been numerous articles about the way that some of the extreme right want to set up their own communities, even states, mm. uh, within, the United, within the United States. Um, I mean, that actually has more echoes, more echoes of the 1860s um, than of anything recently. Um, I think the only lessons we can learn are, are the dangers. Uh, and what we have seen, and it goes back slightly to what I was um, saying in one answer to Clive, um, when you get this vicious circle of rhetoric, um, it's almost impossible to stop. And this is really what created um, this terrifying split in the 20th century, which basically still, to a certain degree, dominates our lives today. I mean, that split between left and right, red and white, uh, communist and fascist and so forth, um, has slightly changed axis because it's now between much more between authoritarianism and, uh, uh, and democracy. Um, but it still comes from the same stem all the way, uh, all the way through. Um, what can you do to stop it? Well, I mean, I remember arguments with sort of uh, Spanish historians who were friends. Uh, they were saying, oh, but Anthony, you know, you exaggerate or whatever. Words don't kill. Well, actually, words do kill. Um, I mean, there we had in uh, 1935 and 1936, uh, Lago Caballero, the, um, who later became the uh, leader of the Socialist Party in the Spanish, who was talking about, he, he, he was very proud of being suddenly being called the Spanish Lenin. And he was talking about the complete annihilation of the bourgeoisie in Spain. Well, I mean, you know, it's not surprising then that a large part of the bourgeoisie then go to support Franco uh, because they become terrorised. At the same time, the left is terrified because they see the horrors perpetrated by Franco and his legionnaires and Moroccan uh, regulares um, in um, uh, 34 in the Asturias uh, and the appalling torture and all the rest of it that was carried out afterwards. So when you get this sort of this circle of fear, it's very, very hard to stop. Um, and I don't think we can learn a lesson which which will teach us on really how to stop it, unless you can somehow stop it earlier on. I mean, my solution would be ban social media, but I mean, I, I know that <laughs> I can imagine how popular I would be if I came out with that. Are you on Instagram? I'm on Instagram, yes. But you are on Instagram. Only, yeah. only if, listen, I've only just joined myself. <laughs> Seriously. I do one or two silly little photographs which might amuse people, but no more than that, I can assure you. Right, I want a question on the left. Gentleman down here. And then we've got one more up on the right, and I think that's going to be And our then lot. that's it. That's ours. Okay. Right. Sure. How inevitable do you think the Bolshevik rise to power was? Because, of course, during the July days, which wasn't necessarily led by the Bolsheviks, but was very heavily influenced and linked to the Bolsheviks, they lost a lot of power. Then, of course, in the Kornel affair, they gained a lot of support as well. Do you think it was necessarily the blundering by the provisional government that led to their rise, not necessarily just the state in Russia? Well, in a curious paradoxical way, I think it helped them because it meant they were still underestimated. You know, the fact Kerensky was unbelievably arrogant and um, unimaginative because uh, he kept it even right up to the very, very end. Uh, he was telling the British ambassador, oh, for goodness sake, don't worry. I mean, you know, the Bolsheviks are no threat whatsoever. Um, and this was only a few days before, um, only a few days before really the... I, what I would call the October coup d'etat. And they, by then, they'd already infiltrated the security services, the communications, the telephone exchanges, and all the rest of it. Um, but the July days, uh, yes, they were a disaster, but the very fact that Lenin had to go underground and that uh, um, they all had to hide and you know, Trotsky was locked up, um, but that actually was not really a disadvantage. I mean, it was simply, again, re-emphasising the uh, prejudices against them by fellow socialists, by the uh, other socialist parties, uh, as well as, of course, by the right, um, thinking that they didn't actually pose a real threat. So, um, you know, one can, one can certainly see it, in, see it in both ways. And then we've got one... One more question. Uh, one, more, what we, one more up there, which is very... One up there? I hope it's oh, oh, there's one. There, yeah, yes, there's a lady there. With her hand, put your hand, put, yeah, give it some action. Yeah, there we go. There we go. If we could get the microphone now to her. Thank you very much indeed. Lovely. 
Um, how do you think that Lenin and the Communist Party were able to so effectively suppress rebellion against grain requisitioning and the Kronstadt sailors? Was it all down to military force? Or? Uh, I think the only, when it comes to the Kronstadt revolt, I think that one can only say um, sheer brutality and um, total ruthlessness. Um, and of course, when it came to the other revolts of um, 1921, Tambov, uh, Western Siberia, and all, all the others, um, we've got no idea really about the numbers who were killed and all the rest of it. Um, when, I, I, when I was in Helsinki, and I mean, actually, I, I, it was any, just as I was leaving, I heard that uh, uh, many of the people involved in the Kronstadt revolt, uh, their grandchildren are still living in Helsinki. Um, they escaped over the ice, some of them with barefoot, running, uh, running across the ice to get away. But, uh, uh, you know, Trotsky and um, saying that he was going to shoot them down like partridges, um, and then when we came to Tambov and all the rest of it, I mean, I think they were actually using poisonous gas uh, against some of the revolting peasants in uh, and the sort of revolts during um, 1921. So, um, you know, if you have got uh, and you have taken power uh, at the end of a civil war like that, you still have the troops in place uh, and you still have the armaments. Um, I suppose, you know, uh, uh, an expert in military power would say, well, you've got to use them. Um, but my God, they were used in a, uh, as I say, in, a, in an utterly, utterly brutal way. It was appalling, the, uh, uh, some of the accounts. I mean, I'm afraid by the end, it was right, right at the end of my book, but I mean, I'm, I bring it in. But I mean, there have been uh, many, have been other books really describing that particular period. Uh, and it was, as I say, deeply shocking. Well, on that cheery note... I know. <laughs> I'm afraid... We shall bring this to an end. So thank you, my dear. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, guys, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. That was really, really intriguing, and hopefully we all learnt something, and... Uh, Vladimir, if you're watching, I hope you learned something too as well. Um, so I think Santa's going to be doing some book signings outside. There are books outside available, so feel free to have a look. Um, for anyone who was watching online, thank you for joining, and hopefully we'll see you all soon. Thank you very much. Great. <laughs>